As if they don't have too much on their plates The Kings of Combat Sports Podcast, John and Wade They'll talk about the things they did that day They'll analyze the work of Vince and Triple H Rewind to Smackdown Rewind to Smackdown Rewind to Smackdown Rewind to Smackdown It is Rewind to Smackdown. Welcome, everybody, to the show. I am John Pollock, joined, as always, by the one and only Wei Ting. Wei, are you, are you doing well? I'm doing well, yeah. I was waiting for the actual question. I know you, you said my name. You had my attention, but I was waiting for the actual question, and I'm doing well. One of these days, I'm going to ask you a different question right off the bat. Just see if you respond just... Uh, out of habit and just say, oh, I'm fine. When really I've asked you, what is your tax situation like? I think it's good, but yeah. Okay. Uh, I await that day. All right. Well, how was your Tuesday? Not bad. Yeah, not bad. I got a haircut. Oh. Um, unfortunately, my, the person I usually get a haircut from, uh, they're away on a vacation. So I had to take the gamble and just show Ooh. up with a, you know, completely uh, random person and we you know i've kind of briefly talked about this like the search for the right person to cut your hair for me at least in my life has been has not it's not been an easy road it's been very difficult john like it's usually a very very long process so i mean i learned today like man like when she comes back whenever my my hairdresser comes back i i will remember to tip her really well so that oh so it didn't go well today no not not at all Mm. like you know and and like i try to take all precautions like i i even have like photos like you know this john i have a photo of like what (laughs) how i like my hair freshly cut uh from all angles that i like the show (laughs) and like you know like the the hairdresser even like wrote down notes like it's detailed john wow this is amazing. She wrote down I, notes. Really, I did not know it was this level of detail that you went into with your barber. Well, my hair is not even that special, but it's just like I don't know. For some reason, I've just had no luck in my life. So, like this person, like saw the notes that the other hairdresser wrote, and and yet, like it was just not that great of a haircut. It wasn't awful, but just you know, you know, you know how it is. See, if I was in your situation, I am. Shave, if they had given me. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm saying if, if I had real hair to speak of and had to go to get a haircut done, I mean, even if they gave me like half a mohawk and dyed it pink, and then at the end of it, they said, what do you think? I would begrudgingly just say, oh, it looks great. In my mind, I'd be dying. But you, you can sometimes be maybe a little more forthcoming. So did they ask you what you thought of this afterwards? And what was your response? Well, I mean, like to to end it, you know, typically it's it's like they show you what what you look like from the back, like they put the mirror behind your head, and inevitably, like I I would I just had enough. I would say, what are you supposed to say? Like, yeah. no, I don't like it. Uh, undo it. Like it's done. It, it gets, like, what are we gonna do? It honestly gets to the point where, like, I think the more you tell them that something is wrong, that you want it fixed, you're risking, you're putting, you're continuing to put yourself at risk. So uh, I I I said, yeah, great. And then just kind of made my way out of there. But you and I had this discussion the other night. The best, the best word is, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." It looks interesting. <laughs> um, I feel like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that could work. That's on. That's on them to interpret, and True. it's not. It's not forward you enough for you say, that you're insulting them. Mm, I don't know if you would call like a haircut that you typically get though interesting. It's all in how you say it. Like they put the mirror there, and and you just go. Oh, that's that's interesting. <laughs> like if somebody cooked you like a hot dog and they asked you how it was, and if you said it was interesting, mm, I think the message the message is pretty clear that it was probably not a very good hot dog. Well, then if you get the follow up and they're like, interesting, is that bad? And you just go, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would say that would be pretty <laughs> obvious at that point. But um, no, the conversation never really got to that. Um, but nonetheless, like it's, you know, it's, uh, I, you know, you, you still tip like I, 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 I'm very non-confrontational when it comes to things like that. See, my wife is brutally honest. Well, that's good too. If I like make some food and it's not good or I pick something that's not good, it's, this was not good, which is, I, I admire that because, you know, then it's not going to happen again. You know what I mean? You have corrected an issue. Whereas I can sometimes fall into the trap where 
in trying to be complimentary, I, I get lumped into something. It's true. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, though, it also depends on maybe the your relationship with the person. Obviously, you know, your wife, she could be brutally honest with you. Um, now, is she brutally honest with your child? I guess it's a little too early to, to do that, but... I mean, he doesn't really ask our opinion of, of too many things other than, you know, he'll take photographs on my on my phone, and I, I think they're amazing. I think his, he's got a real talent. Now, have you, have you guys even, like, had those discussions about, like, you know, how much you might coddle a child versus, you know, how much to, I don't know, be strict? Uh, yeah, we're, we're at that point now, because he will do this thing every every single night at dinner. His way of announcing he's done it's it's very much a timing issue where he will get a look in his face and then he will take his plate and he will throw the remaining food onto the floor that's his signal that he's done and every night oh, now okay. we, we try and that's tell him when you are done it's not interesting it's just really frustrating different. for me it's different <laughs> and we we are trying to convey to him in a stern way that that is not how you end your meal you don't throw your food on the floor and uh, and tonight actually we made him clean it up. Wow! So how, we're teaching him. And did he do a good job? Uh, it was it was all cleaned actually. I went upstairs, I came back, and it had all been cleaned. So uh, my wife might have cheated a little bit, but it was <laughs> the, the sentiment was made. Well, that's wonderful. but he's pretty he's pretty on top of things. I mean, when Way comes over and he's going to leave. Uh, Max will run and like grab his shoes for him and bring them to Way. Yeah, I'm 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 incredibly impressed and honestly a little bit scared because not only does he do that, he's he apparently loves the vacuum, and like you would you just had a a, a new lock put on like one of those electronic locks, and yeah. like you know he's I'm I'm, I'm leaving the door and like in the past like Max is like he's figured out how to open a regular door, so like you installed these new locks and I'm on my way, my way out and Max is running over. And then I'm like, and then John's just like, oh, don't worry. He doesn't know how to open this one. And yes, he does. <laughs> he probably knew how to open it before you did, John. Like, it's it's incredible how quick they learn. It was baby safe for two weeks. Yeah. And then he was on to it. So, no, it's amazing what he can do. He can literally, he can lock me out of my phone. He has done that many a times. But he can also now get into my phone, knows how to get into the camera, and can start taking, like, videos and stuff. It's like, this is just, it's wild for me to watch this. He'll be fixing our internet in no time. <laughs> I, might, I might need that help. All right. Well, we have uh, much to discuss on this show. I think we should start off with the news, Way There's quite a bit of it. And a lot of it centers around this, this deal involving uh, Anthem's purchase of Access TV. And we got uh, some follow-up today. Uh, Leonard Asper did an interview with Multi-Channel News. And, you know, we kind of discussed that this was inevitable, but some major cuts coming down uh, on the access side. It was reported by uh, PWInsider.com that they're – so access had offices in L.A., in Denver, and in Dallas. And it looks like the Dallas office is just being completely gutted and being shut down. Uh, the rap is reporting that about uh, 40 – Members of the uh, 40 people have been laid off at Access TV, and there's people in L.A. that are awaiting uh, what th uh, who they're going to be working for. It certainly seems like a very unstable time if you are part of Access, and this is a, a very, very sad part of the me – not just media, of just business in 2019, mm -hmm. and it's something that – uh, very much uh, bothers me, and not even because necessarily I, I've, I've been part of this, but it's just that something gets sold, and it is because the company has a, become valuable to a certain level off the backs of a lot of hardworking people, and those are the people that typically lose their jobs in a lot of these uh, acquisitions, and sadly, that's what's happening right now with Access TV. Uh, some of the people we know of, uh, Adam Swift, he was, uh, at the time... Uh, he had been overseeing a lot of the content. He had been there for 11 years at Access TV. He was their VP of business and legal affairs, very instrumental in the growth when they were HDNet into Access TV, uh, very hands-on with when ROH was on HDNet, and was the executive producer of New Japan on Access TV. So he was someone absolutely uh, involved in, in all of that, of the pro wrestling content uh, on Access TV. He announced this is his last week there. So um, probably more names will surface, but uh, the rap throwing out that figure of 40 people. Really unfortunate. Um, really unfortunate that, I mean, 
honestly, it's not surprising, but it is surprising that I think it it was it came so suddenly, and that the fact that it affected so many people, um, so suddenly. It's like these people didn't even have a chance. It was yeah. as it was like we're coming in, and it's a numbers game. You are just a number with a salary attached to you, and that's it's very disheartening for employees that it really it has it is no reflection on your work or what you've done. It's just simply this is math, and mm-hmm. you do not figure into our new equation. And it's it's a very sad reality when this occurs. From a you know more of a wrestling perspective, you know the departure of somebody like Adam Swift, and I'm sure like it seems like much of the team, if not all of the team that that's in charge of producing the the English uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, I wonder how many of those people are still around and how much uh, influence they will continue to have in the New Japan uh, presentation on Access. Or if that'll be completely be be taken over by Anthem and you know uh, various producers uh, working with Anthem instead, um, like watching a lot of the Access uh, productions over the years, I I've definitely been impressed at like the graphics and just the amount of work that um, you know those people put towards translating that product uh, to uh, an English speaking audience before like New Japan was even doing regular uh, commentary on their own. So um, I I would love to see some of those people either stay on in other capacities or find jobs in the industry and other places because they are clearly very talented and very knowledgeable about wrestling. Yeah, I'm really surprised someone like an Adam Swift wasn't at least considered for some kind of role, just given his experience level working specifically with pro wrestling. Like to me, that is someone that stands out to me like this could be a great asset to us. Yeah, yeah. I'm, but, I'm, but, I'm, but again, I, I don't think any of this comes down to what people have done. Like, I don't think any of that is taken into consideration. It's just simply that this is all it's, uh, co- it's all cost related. It's all numbers. That's it. It has there is no attachment to um, your resume. Yeah, and I'm curious to know, like, if 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 it's not going to be, you know, if this New Japan stuff isn't, uh, or wow, like, if any of this kind of wrestling related content isn't going to be produced by that department. Is it going to be farmed out to um, perhaps Nashville, perhaps Toronto? Um, that like that's typically what happens in these situations. It's that you are you are not you are not um, uh, mirroring jobs. You are there's a lot of redundancy, and you're going to take stuff in house if you already have the means to do so within uh, within your own uh, kind of environment, your own work environment that you have set up. Yeah, and if it'll be. You know, Nashville, that certainly makes things interesting, uh, you know, if not if if not already more interesting than, than what Howard already is between uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling and Impact. Uh, if Impact essentially becomes the producer of a New Japan Pro Wrestling product on uh, North America television. I would think that the, the Impact New Japan thing, I think that needs to get figured out quickly because it's it's like this really weird – uh, relationship or lack thereof between the two and it seems that it's almost they've got to get into a room and decide are we moving forward with this or are we not because it seems like that decision has to be made yeah yeah i mean i imagine whatever contracts that currently exist still have to be maintained right i i can't see them just cutting ties simply because of of, of a of a buyout but um i yeah some of the more specifics of the production itself i'm, I'm really curious about uh, I also threw this out on Twitter. I got a lot of feedback from people asking what what night and time slot uh, makes the most sense for Impact. And it seems like the consensus is running Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock is what most uh, people who got back to me thought would be the best time to do that, that you have right now an established time slot that people are used to watching on Tuesday nights that is going to be free come October when SmackDown moves out of that slot. Um, is that... Um, you know, you're avoiding the NFL by not running on, on Mondays or Thursdays. And obviously Monday and Wednesdays would just be to me a terrible idea. And Tuesdays that there's a lot of arguments to do Tuesday nights and maybe also a replay in an advantageous time slot, like Friday night after SmackDown or pairing it with new Japan later in the week. Yes. Uh, I think I'm, I'm surprised that WWE themselves haven't announced something for Tuesdays at eight o'clock to replace their own show, either like on the obviously on the network or or some other capacity. To me, like wrestling fans at this point are so conditioned to, you know, watch wrestling on Tuesdays at eight o'clock that I feel like WWE would have kind of 
it, it, at least you know I, they probably maybe have have some plans but i i'm surprised that everybody's so caught up on like wednesday or fridays that you know you're leaving this like beautiful time slot wide open for somebody else to take well it's i think their focus right now is on wednesdays and more more importantly like fox and wednesdays and i i don't know how much wwe is looking at well we're leaving a, a door open for impact wrestling on access but i mean their own network you know, they, they can air stuff at any time. Um, and to me, like that, that little kind of seat between Monday and Wednesday is, is a perfect opportunity for them to push something else, whether it be NXT UK or... Uh, ah, well, we've we've still got work. no official announcement on what the fate of 205 Live is going to be. Is that going to be something that is still taped on Friday nights now and could go on Tuesday nights in its slot? Will that move to Fridays? Uh, what's going to happen with 205 Live? We're a month away and I think that that's still a subject at large that we don't really know what what's going to happen with that show. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's just go a little bit through this interview. This was with uh, Multi Channel News with uh, Anthem's uh, CEO and founder Leonard Asper, where they were talking uh, about the deal. And you know, we we talked about what an ambitious step this was for Anthem, and by the statements made here by Leonard Asper, sounds like they are very aggressive in the market. Where uh, he states. By no means do we want to stop here. I don't think we have enough scale. This is a good start. But yes, we are looking for other opportunities. We want to grow with as much proprietary content as we can and brings up the the purchase of Impact in 2017 and stated uh, with its tape library, uh, that's a very important part of our growth plan, owning content. We believe owning the content and putting it on our channels, but also having it on other people's platforms as well. I call that... You'll like this one way. Untethered vertical integration. Whatever that means. Yes. Yeah. We're not going to make that the show title. <laughs> but uh, yes, untethered vertical inter- integration. U- UV- UVI. Sure. Um, oh, so, I mean, it seems to, to suggest to me that he still has his eyes on selling, uh, co- you know, content he owns. Creating content that they can ultimately make money off of, like rights fees. That would seem like mm-hmm. what they're they're talking about. And... Who's to say that if they have impact on on access, that if they get they got some incredible offer? Like I, I'm always surprised that DAZN has still not gotten into professional wrestling with the amount of money they earmarked for Bellator. That to me, pro wrestling would seem right up their alley. Not to mention all they've invested in boxing. Uh, to me, t- testing the waters with a pro wrestling product and what is available that's out there. Um, mm. you know, th- those are all kind of interesting ones, but I-, I will say this, like you can see with the two stories we just went with, like, here's the one side saying, we're not even done yet. We're looking at more more more. And then you offset that with all of these cuts. And if you're just a consumer and you're watching this, like that is where uh, I think you can, it, it, it irks people at times to, to see that, that it's, you know, on one hand, it's, it's going to be, you know categorized as like cost cutting but on the other side like they sound like they are going to be very aggressive when it comes to uh, acquiring in the future right yeah cost cutting or i i think uh you know eliminate eliminating redundancies is it seems to be maybe more more applicable for for this case but there's a really interesting podcast i listened to not that long ago and it was talking about a lot of you know you know high high end companies that have been moving away from the model of just simply increasing profits every single quarter for their shareholders and altering that thinking. And again, this is, it was kind of presented like, this is what all these companies are saying, but will it actually be applied? But because that there is a a, a sort of a human cost, all of this and, and looking at kind of being, uh, less, less inclined to simply be dictating success by, quarterly growth and looking at, well, if you do decline here, but you're increasing uh, workflow and quality of life for your employees, and that creates a more stable environment. And that's something that is more uh, pre- prevalent today. But again, in practice, will that actually happen? I mean, that's th- these are the realities that you see with these mergers and acquisitions. Like that is just, it's the byproduct of it. It's unfortunate. Um and I don't know if that's necessarily uh, going to change, but that's a much larger scope than just this individual story. Um, going on here, um, they, uh, Asper did talk a bit about uh, 
how these uh, talks came together and stating that um, uh, where was uh, the exact part here about the, uh, the deal? Sorry, I'm scanning uh, through here. They went through all the people that are going to be uh, the board members and then the actual talks, which uh, apparently go back months. And the fact that, you know, this started as a discussion just sort of out of um, – potentially having programming on access and then it sort of grew from there and they were able to uh it graduated into much more significant talks and ultimately ended with what we got on monday what i want to know is when steve harvey entered the picture did he just walk into the room one day and was like hey what do you do wrestling yeah interesting yeah um there could be a great uh kind of uh the oral history of this deal and finding out when did uh, Steve Harvey enter stage right. I'm just waiting for the day like where we either hear like Steve Harvey do a voiceover for like a New Japan Pro Wrestling um, show on Access or we actually see Steve Harvey up here in the impact zone. This was the best paragraph in this. Uh, just what content Steve Harvey will contribute is yet to be determined. Asper said the entertainer is a passionate viewer of all of Anthem's content from MMA to fishing and hunting shows and is heavily involved in the music scene in Atlanta. Okay. Wow. So he's a, he's a passionate fan. Sure. Yeah, I don't doubt that. So um, that's kind of the latest uh, in terms of, uh, you know, it's kind of wait and see now specific to the impact side of when these – when the inevitable changes are going to go through and whether it is something that they they move quickly on to move impact out of the pursuit channel and onto access or if it's something maybe they wait for the pay-per-view to be the hard reset and do a bit of a marketing campaign behind this move to get uh, as much awareness out there as possible but um yeah so you know this is a this is a very pivotal time i would say for impact and anthem they are on much more stable ground, I would say, than they were a week ago, and it's it will remain to be seen. Like what, Im- what impact this will have on the professional wrestling operations? Is Access going to be the game changer that they seem to believe it will be? I, I kind of reserve that that optimism to see what this is ultimately going to matter for Impact, but there is no doubt it's a better placement than they've been for the past year. So. Um, how much better are their fortunes going to be? That's to be determined. Yeah. Moving on from that, we go on over to the WWE and the raw number came out. This was uh, the return of Monday night football, and it was not a good night for raw. They were down 15% from last week. This was their second lowest number of the year. Uh, all that with Steve Austin's return did not uh, really mitigate the tune out factor. Uh, They averaged 2,130,000 viewers. The only show that did lower than this was a uh, show back on June the 10th, which went against a Raptors-Golden State Warriors game that over 18 million people were watching that night. Uh, So tonight, um, Monday, they also had the challenge of um, they were down from last year against the opener of Monday Night Football, although this year's games were much more highly viewed. NFL was up uh, 26 and 10.5% respectively for the two games. So you had a lot more people watching football this year than last. Um, But it was uh, declines throughout the show. Uh, 7.5% drop in the second hour, and then you had a 15.5% drop in the third hour. So from those at the beginning of the show to the end, uh, 21% tune-out factor. And uh, do you think, looking at that way, that this was just... They were going against a a mammoth uh, sports competition, or do you feel that Steve Austin maybe he could have been more strategically placed uh, to build to rather than doing that right off the bat? Because you would have no idea Austin was coming back after that first segment. It's true, perhaps. Um, I mean, I, I I feel most of it would have probably went away due to football anyway. Um, I just I I mean, I, it's hard for me to think. Because Austin, we just saw, I just don't think even Austin appearing was that big of a deal um, in the grand scheme of things. I'm not. I thought he would hold up better than this. Right. Well, I mean, honestly, I, like, I'm not a football fan, so I can't really speak to that culture of things. But I, I imagine they will look at this and just think about it as, you know, football. Like they're they're jug- like can't really beat them. Yeah, it's just uh, 
you know, it's it, it was uh, bigger games this year. Um, but, you know, just just looking at the numbers today, I mean, if you look at uh, a year ago, they're down 21 percent. A year before that, it's 26 percent. So these are these are pretty significant when you have similar competition each year from football. And, yeah, it'll be something to watch throughout this football season. Is this going to be um, a noticeable uh, decline this year? Is football going to have a big impact on uh, Raw's number? Because, you know, the next couple of weeks, I don't think they're going to be uh, priority Raws. Uh, we do know now we're getting the King of the Ring final next week, but I, I don't know if that's going to necessarily be a big deal to people. And then it's kind of you're, you're not going to get anything big on Raw, I guess, until that draft next month. And that's kind of your next big episode of Raw to build towards. Mm hmm. Elsewhere, we also had uh, in the news today. Um, the Verge did this big interview with uh, George Barrios, the WWE's co-president, discussing the network changes uh, this past summer and the switch over from Disney streaming services over to uh, Endeavor Streaming as well as uh, Massive Interactive. So these are the two companies, uh, one pretty much handling the the actual running of the network and then Massive, they were behind the the redesign of the network and they went through – uh, the changes over this summer, a lot of the problems that people have had, including um, I I issues with audio and syncing problems, uh, the the search function for some people, um, just o overall complaints that people have had about this rollout. It has not been a seamless uh, changeover for the WWE Network, uh, but George Barrios uh, reiterated the plan that they are going to be introducing their free tier as well as their premium tier, and it sounds like the free one will be out Within the next month, he said it would be coming in weeks, not months. Uh, they're also going to be introducing a download-to-go feature. Uh, was less open to the idea of moving to 4K programming, stating, you know, if the market goes in that direction, it's something we've experimented with, but didn't seem uh, all that high on making that move anytime soon. Do they even and shoot in 4K? He said that they have, they have done some experimental broadcasts in 4K, but um, it, it's not something that they... He compared it to when they went to HD. They waited until around 25 to 30% of homes were HD capable. So it seems like it's very much like like 3D was going to be the big thing like eight, nine years ago. And it really never took off. And now it seems they maybe have a similar attitude towards 4K. Where is 4K going to be something that all these – if we're going to invest in 4K technology, is it something – are we too far ahead of the public where – you know, 4K is still in its infancy. It's ridiculous because, like, TV uh, companies are, are already trying to upsell you on 8K televisions now. And I'm perfectly happy, honestly, watching 720p many times. So I, I have, like, an, I still have, like, a tube TV, like, at my parents' house that I, I don't mind at all. So anyway, maybe you're talking to the wrong person, but I don't really care about 4K. Are you telling me you were unaware that over the summer the WWE Network went from 720p to 1080 um, I didn't know because they they did do that. I learned that sure. in this article. I was not aware okay. of this. Um, it, it's a, it's an interesting article. Um, at the end, the interviewer does ask a question about AEW, and George Barrios gives us the best George Barrios answer. Well, uh, welcome to the game. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, the game. How nice of him. It was also um, another thing in this. They do talk about their strategy when it comes to YouTube and the person interviewing Barrios kind of phrased it like, is it, is it kind of a risk to be too good at YouTube? And no one would doubt WWE are monsters in that space, but talking about, you know, kind of, are you taking eyeballs away from your television properties that you're giving them this very easily digestible content? And Barrios didn't really go into their strategy and say, you know, we have made some changes. And I think people can see that they're they're, they're kind of now just putting the clips on after the show, not during. Um, but, yeah, talking about, you know, stuff that we've discussed as well as YouTube having a much easier way that you can follow the product and never have to tune into USA Network to watch Raw or SmackDown. It's, it's interesting um, because I'm sure for a lot of people, it's their means of trying to keep up with wrestling. And if they didn't have as big of a presence on YouTube, would they completely alienate those fans and make them not watch or pay attention or you know, potentially watch the month to month pay-per-views at the very least? Um I, well, that was Barrios' argument was we don't want to lose these people that maybe are fringe fans or that's 
that's as much as they want to keep up with. So that's that's the balancing act. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wonder how much he he might even know. I think all this is is still like I think wrestling fans' viewing habits are are changing pretty pretty quickly, like from year to year. So um, I'm sure it's a sensitivity they will continue to try to gauge. All right. Um, the rest of the news you can find all over at postwrestling.com. Uh, coming up this week, Way and I will be back for our third straight night on Wednesday with the double shot. And what is on tap for Wednesday? We'll be talking about episode seven and eight of this season, season three of Glow. So uh, we got two here and then two more after this. So, uh, yeah, that's that's about it for me. Anything else? No, that's uh, we, we, we've got Glow coming up and we'll see if we tap into run into anything else over the next 24 hours. But for sure, we'll have a deep dive into Glow. Looking forward and to why, it. And why it's very important to uh, make sure your heart is in working order. Uh, yes, yes. I watched the episode a while ago, so I actually kind of forgot about it. I'm, oh, OK. I actually skipped ahead, John. I'm, I'm on episode nine. Sorry. You've gone ahead? I've gone ahead. Oh I couldn't stop. I can't believe you. I couldn't stop. I, I, I'm actually behind. I haven't even watched. Uh, I, I've watched one episode for our review this week. I, I, I have to watch the other one tonight. Usually after SmackDown is when I catch up on Glow. I like. So it's all fresh. I like actually watch them like without taking notes. And then I go back to rewatch just so like because I, I don't want to like watch and take notes at the same time. So. You, you should have you should have brought like wireless headphones and watched it while you were getting your haircut done. Uh, I think that'd be difficult, and yeah. I th- that'd be a little crazy. I it would could say. be, could be a little intense. All right, uh, then on Thursday we've got the cafe hangout, three o'clock Eastern. You can tune in live if you're a double double ice cap or espresso member of the cafe. Jimmy Corderas will be stopping by. We're going to preview Clash of Champions and chat. All the news that's going on, never a shortage of it. Uh, we will get all caught up with Mr. Corderas, uh, who's going to be featured in a, I believe, a made-for-TV movie on Discovery on Wednesday night. Okay, interesting. Yeah, go to his Twitter, at Jimmy Corderas. He's got all the information there. Wednesday night, it is airing. So maybe cool. we'll chat with him about uh, his acting career as well. Uh, Thursday, we've got Up Next as well with Braden and Davey. That's going to be dropping uh, the... Final NXT before they go to the USA Network next week. Yes. Wow. Holy shit. It's already wow. It's next week, the, oh September 18th. They're on USA. I, so. I really feel like they would have made a bigger deal out of it, but maybe you'll you'll see it Monday or Tuesday. I think they have to go really hard. I have, I have been disappointed with the promotion. Granted, you could argue that September 18th is the soft launch, mm-hmm. and if you want to make a big deal out of something – why waste it on the first two weeks? Like, great, create your base, and October second is the real launch. <laughs> Excuse me, I suppose so. It's one way of thinking about it, but then why launch on September eighteenth at all? Well, I said that right at the beginning. I thought that starting on September eighteenth was actually a negative because people are going to know what to expect from NXT, and you're eliminating the surprise factor that AEW still has of what is this show going to look like. And if I was NXT, I would have and. The fact that we we haven't even talked about this, like them announcing the fact that now the first hour is going to air on USA. The second hour is going to air on the WWE Network for September 18th and 25th because Suits is still airing on USA from 9 till 10. So Mm -hmm. that series has to wrap up and then they go to the full two hours on October 2nd. Yes, yes. This came out like right as we finished the Hangout on uh, last Thursday. But um, uh Stanford just screwing with us. I wonder, like, if this was known beforehand or or what. But it uh, had to be known, yeah. and I would would imagine that they just wanted to get the news out that they're going to USA, and then they would slide in. Of course, they would have to know. Like, Suits is the major series on, or one of them on USA. Uh, they had to have been aware that we're not going to be airing the two hours. But that's really hard to put in the initial press release and explain yeah. how confusing that is. Rather than, well, we'll just slip this in. The week before. I think it'll be a little confusing, like, on the day of, because... It will be. Um, it will be. There will be people tuned in, and potentially new viewers, that are then going to be sent to a streaming platform that, that have maybe many for. of them don't have. Yeah, I could... I, I don't think it's the smoothest. I really think, in hindsight, they should have just started on October 2nd. I think that would have been the night to launch, and then I, I think or, it makes... Or why not just do one hour for these two weeks? You could have done that, too. Yeah, you could have done that, too. Anyway, um, 
Friday. We Friday we've got uh Rewind Away, where we are going to be reviewing the 2017 Royal Rumble. Uh, did you watch the Royal Rumble without notes and then rewatch it and take notes? That I did not do. No? Have that you started the Royal do. Rumble? I have, actually. I'm, uh, I'm on uh, Cena versus AJ. I'm actually looking forward to that match and the Rumble itself. Okay. Well, no spoilers for way of who won. Uh, that's uh, And we will be joined by... The world famous archivist on Friday's Rewind Away. Yeah, the archivist will be here. He's counting down our, his top ten favorite review aways because this, actually, in about like an hour, John, I would say, is like the actual um, ten year anniversary of us doing the show. So, uh, happy anniversary, John! Uh, Congratulations. Re- review away. That is, and uh, the archivist is going to be revealing his top ten number one on this re- Rewind Away. So, do check it out. Well, what if our review of the Royal Rumble 2017 tops everything? He won't have heard it. Um, well, I, I think he's talking about review away. They're his top ten rewind aways. Oh, maybe okay. we'll have to. Have I was going to give him grief for not picking any recent ones, but then I, 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 I understand now the separation. We'll have to have him back on in, in about ten years. For that. Okay. That's on Friday, and then uh, going into the weekend, Wayne and I will be live Sunday night immediately after Clash of Champions. Again, if you are a Double Double Ice Cap or Espresso member, you can watch us live doing the post show and call in if you so choose to chat about Clash of Champions. Uh, maybe we'll get some notes from the AAA show at the Hulu Theater. Uh, it's a busy weekend. Uh, are, are you on the fence? Are you going to be watching Bloodsport on Saturday night? I actually made plans on Saturday night, but I will want to uh, check it out after the fact if I can't watch it live. I am... I'm going to be watching the UFC card on Saturday night. It's a really solid card in Vancouver. Donald Cerrone versus Justin Gaethje. So um, I'm going to watch that. I don't know if I'll have time to watch uh, Bloodsport, but it looks like a really cool card. They just added Nick Gage and Killer Cross as yeah. well to that show. So I think that's going to be. I think that's going to get a lot of interest this weekend. It's it's a crowded weekend, but I think that Bloodsport it's it's one of the better promoted shows. I I think that that show has been built up better than the AAA show on Sunday. I completely agree. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, you know, with the with the loss of John Moxley, it, it, the card certainly takes a hit. But I, I think his attachment to it anyway, and also the success of the one during WrestleMania weekend, uh, has a lot of people very excited. Definitely. All right. So there you go. Postwrestling.com, postwrestlingcafe.com. Now we head into SmackDown Night 2 at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Apparently before the show, they taped the match between Ali and Buddy Murphy that sounded like it was great. I don't know what this was um, well, taped for. Last time I went to SmackDown, it was just a dark match. What a, what a waste. I, w- I would have liked to have seen this. Yeah. Um, maybe somebody bootlegged it. This might have been the best match on the whole taping. Uh, so then we uh, start off the show with The Undertaker. He comes out. He considers MSG his home. And he's unsure how many more times he will get to come home. And he talks about the Titans, the legends, and the heroes that were born here and had a piece of their soul taken by him. But now it's time that we usher in a new era of superstar. And Sami Zayn interrupts The Undertaker. He puts over The Undertaker for selling out this arena for 30 years. And he respects The Undertaker, but it shouldn't be him that's opening this show. And it should be him. The crowd is telling him that he sucks And he keeps repeating that he is saying all this respectfully and respectfully asks the Undertaker to leave, pass the torch, because the garden is in good hands with him. I give you my word. So Taker hands over the microphone, and he goes to exit. Sammy starts gloating, and Taker returns to chokeslam Sammy. Thanks for coming out, Undertaker. That was it. Yeah, that was it. No Bray Wyatt. Um... Nothing. Uh, After we crafted nothing. that that whole idea on Monday, nothing. No. I mean, it was very reminiscent of of, of the Austin uh, appearance on Monday, and really a lot of their celebrity. I would say a poor man's version of Monday, perhaps. Yeah, where I, I don't think there were, were too many interactions with the current roster. At least, you know, no no attempt was really made to give somebody on the current roster the rub, so to speak. Um, it it just felt like a a generic taker appearance, choke slam entrance. Uh, just to elicit a big reaction from this audience. And, you know, could they have... Maybe he just has no program at the moment. You know, he is sort of still an active wrestler. Um, maybe they just don't have any ideas of, like, you know, what would be a worthy... Who would be a worthy person to, like, you know, give value to? Like, what could they have done even? I'm not really sure. 
but I think the idea was to simply have the Undertaker do his entrance in Madison Square Garden. And I will say, like, lately I feel like we, you know, this 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 uh, Taker entrance has kind of lost its luster because we've seen it so often this year. But under the MSG roof, it feels special. And I think they captured the atmosphere really well on, the po- uh, on this broadcast. Um, and thankfully, like, the man still looks the part. Like, he's... He's slim, like he looks to be in shape, can can slow walk like like uh, as good as he ever could. Uh, and he sounded good in his promo too. And I thought Zane was hilarious. Zane was very funny, I, I thought uh, as well. And, you know, as we're recording this, um, the tapings are still not over. I think 205 Live, it's still going on right now, which uh, Kushida appeared on 205 Live tonight as uh, Jack Gallagher's partner. Uh, but oh, maybe. No. That's terrible. Oh, wow. Well, That's not a good, I... good sign. Might not be, um, but it, there's the potential. Maybe the Undertaker does some other spot at the at the end for the live crowd. But anyway, Taker Kushida. I mean, there you go. Uh, possibly, possibly. I believe they announced. Uh, I saw um, somebody tweet out the uh, dark match made event of uh, the Fiend and the B team versus the B team. Yeah. So yes, uh, brother versus brother, brother versus brother, and friend. Yes. All right, um, so that was that segment, and then Shane McMahon is backstage, and he meets with Chad Gable, and he states that Elias has broken his ankle, and he has not figured out who Gable's opponent is going to be tonight, uh, but he's going to face someone in the King of the Ring tournament, and it could be someone from Raw, could be someone from SmackDown, it might be someone that was already eliminated in the tournament, and uh, Elias did suffer an ankle injury, um, and so it was a legitimate injury. And Do we yeah, know when? Was, I am not sure when this actually occurred. Um, we'll try and find that out. But yeah, he was just removed. Uh, wasn't on the show at all here. And yeah, we'll get into what they did to replace him. But I will say this with Elias, regardless of the extent of the injury, he's also a character that doesn't necessarily need to, like it would be a bitch to get around uh, traveling. But this is a guy that could still just do TV for as long as it takes to heal and not have to wrestle. Oh, yeah. He could do a song. Like, he could actually work the ankle injury into, like, the, the gimmick. To do a King of the Ring semifinal might have been a different story, though. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, they they said on the broadcast it was a, it was a broken ankle. Uh, I don't know 100% if it was broken or if it was just uh, an injury to the ankle. But um, that sounds like that was what occurred here with him. The Miz and Andrade was our first match. Uh, Shinsuke Nakamura was on commentary and said very little. Well, he said a lot, but in Japanese. I didn't even, like, notice him throughout, like, the second half of this. I forgot he was even on commentary. Um, maybe I just wasn't listening properly. You gotta uh, get on that Duolingo, man. I guess so. Uh, Miz hit a flapjack. I do like that they've given Sami Zayn uh, as his mouthpiece. So they decide for the first time ever to put Nakamura on commentary. Interesting. Okay. Like now, now we're going to have him do yeah. a talking segment now that we've given him that specific function. Uh, Miz did the tranquilo pose after hitting a flapjack. Uh, Zelina then attacked Miz, allowing Andrade to land a running drop kick. Go through the break. Uh, Miz attacks Andrade on the floor, gets into Nakamura's face, and then throws Andrade into Nakamura that they state are the mind games from the Miz. Vega then grabs at Miz's leg, leading to the Judas effect by Andrade. And then Andrade goes for his moonsault, lands on his feet, goes for the follow-up moonsault, and it looks like Miz was supposed to catch him for the skull-crushing finale. This did not go as planned, and then Miz had to adjust and hit the skull-crushing finale for the win over poor Andrade. I didn't think it was a great match. Um, even beyond, perhaps, you know, the the screwy finish, I, I, I found myself kind of bored, and maybe... You know, despite, like, feeling like Miz has had, like, good performances. In this match, though, for whatever reason, to me, he just appeared to be really slow. And his offense looked really soft. Like, he'd fit really well, like, probably in the 80s. But in 2019, I I certainly don't understand why they continue to push him as a babyface. Because I think this babyface Miz experiment has certainly run its course. Um, this match on the weekend, I, I have zero interest for. Even Andrade in this match, I thought was well, it was just kind of average. But Nakamura versus Miz, I 
I thought all this was about as generic of a WWE wrestling segment as you can get. Heel on commentary. He attacks after the bell. Um, just feels like it'll be time fill for the pay per view. Yeah, it's just not a program I'm really into, um, especially uh, with the with the Miz. Um, afterwards, Nakamura attacked Miz, hit him with the Kinshasa. This could end up on the kickoff on Sunday, to be honest. Sure, and, and that's fine. Shane is with Apollo Crews and Matt Hardy to remind you that they exist. And he asks where Chad Gable is. Chad walks in. Shane pretends he can't see him. Matt Hardy so still short. goes to TV? Yeah, he was wow. there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Shane says, I found an opponent who Elias has approved of. Shane walks off the screen, comes back in, and announces it will be him taking on Chad Gable. Yeah. Um, I actually think it's quite brilliant. You know, especially if the Elias injury is legit, which I believe it is. It is. Uh, I mean, if you know, if you told me that the plan was to replace Elias with Shane from the beginning, I would have absolutely believed it because I think it makes the semifinal way more interesting. I don't think Elias versus Gable would have really elicited the same amount of interest or heat as Shane McMahon doing the same thing he did at Crown Jewel, sneaking in at the end, trying to get that victory. Um, I actually thought it was a great way to like take advantage of of a curveball. They had Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville came, come out. Mandy cut a promo saying that Nikki Cross will never look like her. She would be embarrassed to look like Nikki. She's beautiful. Nikki is ugly. And they showed two photos of uh, the two of them side by side. Rose says, handsome men open doors for me. They shut them on Nikki. She looks like an oversized rat climbing out of the Lincoln Tunnel. And then Alexa Clum comes out. And that prompts Nikki to storm the ring and attack Mandy as we get into our match. I thought this sucked. <laughs> I thought the angle sucked. I thought the match sucked. Um, to me, it was like really unimaginative and just kind of like ch- cheap and trashy television. Um, like what happened to trying to build these two based off of them beating the champions and just wanting to ha- them to have a match that way? I just I know like Rose's gimmick is supposed to be like this kind of like self obsessed like you know, um, whatever, like a uh, model or, or somebody who's, who just thinks that they're, they're way better looking than somebody else. But I, I feel like there's at least like, I don't know, maybe a more, a more thoughtful and I think uh, smarter way of, of uh, doing it rather than simply saying you're ugly and showing two side by side photos of, of somebody. Um, to me, it just felt really cheap and maybe not, I don't know, maybe something that belonged more um, on glow. Did like you the, not like think the, like the actual glow? Yes. Uh, did you not agree with Corey Graves' comparison of Mandy Rose to a pretty Luthes? I I um. Well, I never really saw like what Luthes looked like. Uh, he was a handsome man in his time. Yeah, but I don't I don't know what he would have looked like with blonde hair. So. I'm waiting yeah. for someone to create Luthes in the next video game, and he, Luthes comes out to Mandy Rose's theme. I'm not. Okay. Uh, she applied a straight jacket choke, cross and rammed her head into the buckle. Phillips mentions that Mandy was in, uh, was utilizing, you'll never guess it way, mind games on Nikki. Bliss then yanks DeVille off the apron. Nikki misses the high cross. Rose misses a knee strike. Roll up by Nikki. She wins in 317. So the champions beat the challengers going into our pay-per-view. Uh, this was the, this, this existed actually kind of decreased my interest in the match you know i was uh actually you know i'm still curious to see like how rosa deville will look in that environment but i've certainly been a little confused with how they've, they've been pu- pushing alexa and nikki um it seems like this week they or at least for this program they're complete baby faces but they will switch like you know no depending on the they're week. in the utility role they will fill yeah. the role that they need yeah uh, that that has an opening if we're pushing a heel team they're the babyface team. If we're pushing a babyface team, they can be the heels. And that kind of just leaves them in limbo with these titles that are dead weight at this point, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Heavy Machinery was in the back drinking protein shakes. And then Bailey met up with Ember Moon. Ember said that they talked about elevating the division. And then you attack Becky Lynch with a chair. Somehow this devalues the division. She said, that's not the Bailey that I know. And I blame Sasha. Bailey says, I did it for the division and for the title. Moon says, Bailey, you're better than that. It's you 
struggling to be relevant as champion ever since Sasha came back. And Bailey says, what do you know about being champion? And she says, what I do know is that you lost to Charlotte last night. And they announced they're going to have a match tonight. Mm-hmm. This was um, some. Hmm. This was some very fierce interaction. Listen, I I think the acting is about the level that you would expect for a professional wrestling show, which is to say, like not very good at all. But I thought, like for what they were looking to accomplish, it was well written. You know, like it, it shed light on Bailey's current mind mind frame, and it's that she's a heel who still thinks of herself as a baby face. She still thinks everything she's been doing has been noble and for a good cause, even though I think to the audience, you see that she's she sold, sold herself out. Um, it, it gives Ember a, a level of depth, you know, to be the one to call Bailey out on, on those actions. And it set up the match. So I, I really had no problem with it. I, you know, again, the, the, the acting is only going to be so good. Heavy Machinery took on a team consisting of Alex Keating... And Johnny Silver. So any, any significance? Uh, it it just works out perfectly that on Glow this week we're gonna have a Michael J. Fox reference, and then Alex Keating was on SmackDown this week. I don't get it. Well, who's Alex Keating? Michael J. Fox played Alex Keating on Family Ties. Oh, okay. That, that was his character's name. Oh, interesting. Yes. Uh. They destroyed Alex Keating and Johnny Silver and hit them with the Caterpillar Compactor and the family defeated. Never mind. I had nothing. A minute 58. Descended. <laughs> yeah, jobber match. Um, fast. Was it? You Otis know. was fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wonder if like the fact that we, we see these guys in a jobber match this week indicates that they will have an actual angle for them next week, like we saw perhaps with the Viking Raiders, who last week had sort of like your reintroduction jobber match, and this week uh, was a part of like a, a, a raw main event. So I wonder if this is just a way to like reheat up uh, heavy machinery. You know, Family Ties only aired for seven seasons. That's a long time. 82 to 89. I guess that's a good run. Alex P. Keaton, fictional character. I never. I was. I, I like that show. I, I didn't watch it religiously, but I watched enough of it. It's got like I kind of just missed it, but uh, I did see some reruns of it. It was an okay show. I remember the theme song. The theme song was very cheesy, but it was like one of those earworms that was just stuck. If you would hear it, I wasn't even in the country when this was. Oh, out. oh you missed out. Growing pains. Yes, growing yeah. pains. Full house. That was my shit. Growing Pains caught me. Yeah, full house, all in. Shane McMahon was with Kevin Owens in his office. He is reconsidering this $100,000 fine, and he's going to make him the referee tonight for the Chad Gable match, and the fine will disappear if Owens does his job correctly. Yeah, they had to remind him. Like Owens had to remind him that it wasn't last week. It was two weeks ago, which was pretty funny. Yes, he did bring that up. He was yeah. uh, Shane was on jury duty. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And now he might uh, – this would technically be extortion that he was uh, caught on camera applying. Well, only we know that, right? Yes, yes. The the invisible camera backstage caught mm-hmm. him. Eric Rowan comes out, and he grabbed the microphone. I was like, oh, no. He says, I'm not controlled by anyone. What? Look into these eyes, and you will see what makes me tick and what I'm capable of. People think that I'm a mastermind, a schemer, but you people only see a brute. And then Roman Reigns cut him off. Listen, Ro- Rowan put all he needed into this, but this guy's just not a great talker, at least not yet. You know, I'm not sure if I've heard Rowan speak, like in a solo promo setting since the whole Vintner thing. Um, he certainly didn't have that much time here, but honestly, uh, if he went another minute, I don't know if... That would have helped. No, he, he needed to be cut off yeah. earlier than he was. Um, this did not need to go in on any longer. This is a guy that he's going to get over through his 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 physicality and looking like Eric Rowan because I, I don't know, just the the talking did not compute. Like with this I, I think they're they're continuing, and this was the case I think with the Vintner thing. They're trying to like sell us on like this kind of sophisticated monster, a guy who on the surface looks like a brute, but you know. 
uh, has uh, apparently a great mind for recycling um, heavy, heavy metal bands and and wine. And Lots I just, of band shirts. He supports a lot of bands. Yes, and I just I don't know if that's what the audience wants, nor do I feel like he really has the ability to pull off that type of character. Have you ever called yourself a schemer? Um, no, but maybe people I'll think start. I'm a schemer. <laughs> Roman Reigns comes out. They have this big brawl. He hits a Superman punch, but Rowan stays up. They fight into the crowd. Uh, Rowan lifts up a fan who had the most ridiculous look on his face as he got powerbombed onto security. You can tell Uh, he was a plant because he was wearing an Elias t-shirt. Oh, I mean, he pretty much had roots climbing out of his shoes and into the ground. (laughs) Uh, We had blue suit Pat Buck and red suit Sanjay Dutt out. Uh, Maroon, I would say. Uh, Maroon would be probably a better uh, uh, look at looking really snazzy. I would, Dude, I, ima- I imagine this like, guy almost uh, could have given Rowan or Reigns a paper cut. He was looking so sharp. Wow, yeah, like I, I you know, I'm sure like as as an agent, you're you're supposed to, you're encouraged obviously to wear your suits, but I have to imagine Sanjay is like probably among the better dressed agents that are back there. Probably Sanjay Dutt's first time at Madison Square Garden, I would think. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is an so. obvious show that I'm skipping in my head. I'm sure he was there, you know, backstage for some, or or um, watching something maybe. But yeah, maybe as a performer, okay. If you consider this performance, mm, l- loosely, yes. Uh, he was involved with the show. Who would you? Who could would give Sanjay a run for for his money as like best dressed agent back there? Probably not Jeff Jarrett. Um, certainly is not Adam Pierce who, um, Adam Pierce man. always has a really nice look. Um, I don't know about can, that. Did you see what he was wearing today? This was MSG. What was like, he had like a tan suit or it something like a on, tan and then like a baby blue, like Jack. Anyway, it was, a. I, uh, I like the, the color pattern that the man is confident to put onto television and he's out yeah. there a lot. So he, he changes it up. Um, but Sanjay Dutt to me has kind of set the bar now. When it comes to Certainly. best dressed agents. Certainly. Rowan launched himself at Reigns, took everyone down. Then Reigns hit another Superman punch. And then Rowan grabbed the jib camera and swung it at Roman, yelling, Sunday, Sunday. And then Reigns got to his feet. No camera was going to keep him down. And the crowd chanted for Roman. So the segment got over pretty well to the New York crowd. They They got the reaction they wanted. And there's yeah. our match on, on Sunday. This is a very big... Uh, opportunity for Eric Rowan. I hope they don't book this to go longer than it needs to because they could maybe have an entertaining seven, eight minute, like intense brawl. But it's it's a very important spotlight match for Eric Rowan because uh, if this dies, I could see them really scaling back on Rowan's push. I wonder if you'll kind of get a similar style of match. I mean, we don't think I don't think there's any stipulation attached to it, but um, it would certainly be a match that. You know, watching this type of brawl uh, would would kind of call for it, right? And we know that Reigns has had great matches with like people like Braun Strowman uh, in these types of settings. Like he works really well with other big men. He's able to like work a very physical style with them. And for Rowan, it is an absolutely very important and very good test to see what level of chemistry he might have with the biggest star of the company. Whether or not they could uh, move forward with Rowan uh, beyond you know this this supporting role. Um, and I think it'll also be a great test for the announcers and also for you, John, who will have to expertly oh, navigate yeah. <laughs> between these two names during and after the match uh, in your play, play-by-play and recaps. Man, that's going to be uh, – I think there's going to be a lot of uh, Reigns and Eric. Sure. Just be glad, like, Strowman isn't a part of this too. Oh, Jesus. I wouldn't – I'd just give up. Hey, is this going to lead to Reigns and Rowan uh, with Daniel Bryan suspended above the ring in a shark cage? Probably not. Um, no, da- no Daniel Bryan on this show at all. Do you think yeah. we? Well, we, we'll we'll talk about Clash. Uh, of Champions he doesn't later. need to be here. Like Rowan is is the figure. Uh, I imagine he might show up, maybe even on Sunday. But no, I don't think Daniel Bryan will show up ever in a shark cage. John, come on, it would be a human cage because I think he's he'd be protective of animals. You're right. Bryan would probably be ethically against a shark cage. Yeah. 
Um, then they promote um, during the commercial breaks. They were promoting uh, Seth Rollins and the Fiend for house shows coming up later this month, uh, specifically for Edmonton on September 21st. I'm very curious how those matches get over, and the fact that they're going to be doing them on the road first to I guess see because especially if it's Rollins coming out and that's the Hell in a Cell match. You're really going to have to fight the audience with The Fiend that I think a lot of people are going to get behind as a babyface. For sure. For sure. I think the other question is, you know, how long are these matches going to go? Uh, we've only seen The Fiend in one match thus far. And I mean, short. it was short. So uh, the appeal of the character, I think, is is the fact that it's, you know, it's it, the appearances are kept very minimal. And we haven't seen really The Fiend sell yet. So... On on a house show scale, I imagine you'll probably see only a version of it that might be different from the way it might look in a Hell in a Cell. Uh, but nonetheless, it will be interesting, sure. I think that's a like a legitimately like interesting because for the longest time it's been Rollins and Corbin that have been married at all of the house shows this summer. Um, if that was coming to my local town, that's a match I would want to go out and, and see just to see how the match goes and the presentation of the whole thing. I'd be very curious to see how that goes. Bailey, Ember Moon, non-title match, Charlotte's on commentary. Uh, there's a reverse cross off the middle rope by Moon. This is after they go through a commercial. Flair says that Bailey needed a more aggressive side. And there's a knee strike from Bailey that sends Moon to the floor. Moon stops a dive, and then the eclipse gets avoided. Bailey to belly, and just like that, Bailey gets her win. And a short match. Um, I thought it was fine. Just a win for Bailey, uh, coming off the loss to Charlotte on Monday, and that's kind of what Ember's role was to be here, just to uh, kind of be cannon fodder for Bailey. I feel like I, I, I feel like I barely saw this match. I feel I feel like a lot of it was lost to commercial, so don't really have much. It was of not long when they came back. Yeah, Charlotte entered the ring, points to Bailey's title, and then point points out the ten sign. Ten she started sign. Doing, she started doing the ten with her two hands because she's going for her tenth title reign. Oh, okay, okay. Right. So um, she's not stealing someone's gimmick. Man, maybe another flair is going to get caught up in a trademark issue. Maybe she wants Tully in her corner. Maybe that's oh, it. Who wouldn't want Tully in their corner? Yeah. Kevin Owens is showing stressing out in the locker room with his referee shirt on. We're going to have lots to say about Kevin Owens by the end of this night. <laughs> Kofi Kingston. This was our tee up. Coming up. Kofi Kingston is going to relive the moment that put him on the map 10 years ago. Uh -huh. so he, was, he was going to come out to the ring to relive a moment that changed his life. I feel like you could have just done this on your laptop in the middle of the afternoon. But this is going to be our what? whole segment. So oh, you mean like he was going to come out just to reminisce? That's the segment. He's coming out <laughs> to the ring to relive the moment no, that put on. him on the map. To relive it. He ended up actually reliving he, it. He, yeah, sure. Well, and more importantly, I think he wanted to... He he was going to talk about it. That's all. I thought it was actually cool that they managed to find a photo. I mean, I wonder if this photo is actually there all the time or not. But I imagine... It, I'll give them the benefit of the, of the doubt and think that it was a legitimate photo that was found in the halls of MSG. A photo of him doing the boom drop. Oh, they, they had that backdrop on Raw, and they had it here. I, I think it was just WWE, like, put together, like, a little, like, uh, they, they had several of those where it was, like, you know, WWE moments at the Garden. I know what you're talking about. Um, so, anyway, Kofi comes out. He says it was here that his career changed forever when he stepped up to Randy Orton to show that he belonged here, whooped them all over the arena, and then you all chanted my name. So, on cue, they chanted his name here. And he knew he would come back as WWE champion 10 years later, I guess. And that day has come. And they show the footage from November of 2009. This made me feel very old way, knowing that this Raw ended with you and I going on uh, stick cam and reviewing this. Did it? Really? Well, we would have been reviewing it at this point. Oh. Was no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. 2009 was before we did Raw. Never mind. Yeah. This was, yeah. uh, I've got all our, our dates mixed up now. This was pre Rewind to Raw. The stick cam, the first stick cam show we did was the Pipe Bomb. Oh, that was until 2011. Yeah. But we were recording them like before yeah. that. So some, some God, time remember after when we tried to do video stuff and there were all these technical problems? Those were the days. Yeah. <laughs> Never <laughs> happens anymore. They um, showed the boom yeah. drop. 
off the balcony, putting Orton through the table 10 years ago. And as Kofi is speaking in the ring, Orton shows up in the crowd with a microphone yelling, stupid. He compares what Kofi's done to what he's done in the past 10 years, winning seven titles, two Royal Rumbles, a Money in the Bank, and this Sunday, he's taken the title. And Kofi has pretended to be someone he isn't, going back to his Jamaican accent, his dreadlocks, and the phony power of positivity. And somewhere in all of this, they felt the need to censor him. So I don't know if he included some... He said, he said bullshit. In there. Oh, okay. His bullshit power of positivity? Something like that, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, Kingston goes after Randy, gets hit with a chair. Again, all Randy does is call him stupid. Kofi fights back with the chair, sets up a table to redo the spot from 10 years ago. They continue to fight. Kofi is placed on the table. He kicks a chair away, but in the process, the table breaks. He's put himself through a table. Man, uh, so I felt so bad for them because like, this whole thing was designed for that table spot. And I, I wondered if they would have a backup table out in the like staging area back there. And thank Imagine they, they didn't. Did. Oh, yeah, this would have been ruined. This was uh, These are pros. They knew yep. to have backups here. So he just set up another table, and it was seamless. And he hit Orton with the chair, climbed up the balcony, and jumped through and gave him another boom drop. And I, I thought for sure this was going to end with some counter where somehow he RKO'd Kofi through this table and turned the tables. But instead, Kofi just redid the spot. I thought it was... Almost kind of anticlimactic. They just, like, redid the spot. I thought it should have been Orton going into this with, like, Mm. one up on him. I think because Orton's gotten so much already in this feud, you needed Kofi to get his revenge. I think that's what I was looking for last week. I mean, if you remember, like, it's been the revival, like, three-on-one on on him all the time. Like, Big E and Woods are gone. Kofi needed something big, and this was something big. I love the fact that, you know— by by happenstance this 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 happened to be in msg and that they were able to to redo the exact same thing it was wonderful i thought orton's promo beforehand um you know even uh throwing the bullshit bomb in there whatever like despite that every everything was great um i thought it worked out well kofi looked like a, a star coming out of it orton looked like an asshole um to me, and it, 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 I love any time they, they try to reflect back on nostalgia, especially 10-year-old nostalgia. So it was awesome, I thought. It, this was a good angle. Good angle to, to set you into the pay-per-view uh, with these two. And yeah, the location really worked for this go-home show, the way this all turned out. And that the fact that that Madison Square Garden show has been such a prominent uh, feature of this program. It's not something like they just pulled out of left field tonight. It's been prevalent throughout the whole program. Yeah, really brilliant, whoever uh, made that connection. Main event was Chad Gable and Shane McMahon. Kevin Owens comes out as the referee. Gable is coming out, and his entrance music stops as he's on the ramp, cut off by Shane's, who comes out with the the best-in-the-world trophy and places it on the throne with the crown. And Shane starts the match, and he gets down on his knees to fight Gable. Listen, I know sometimes I'm very critical of Shane McMahon. I thought he was great here. His role was strictly to get over Chad Gable, and I thought he played a really great heel in this. I thought it was fantastic, and I think he's really been fantastic. Um, but, you know, all of my, I think, uh, praise for him would have hinged on the result of this match. So I, I've now I could say that, yeah, he was great. But if the result was very different, I would have, I think, have a, had, had, I would have had a very different opinion. They started it off where... Gable grabbed a waist lock and hit the chaos theory, and which needs a name by this point. This guy, this call is his it, main why not move. call it the chaos theory? Great, Based we'll call it respect. that. They just, they just, they call it nothing right now. Yeah. Uh, and Owens counts three in thirty-one seconds. So they announce Gable as the winner, and then Shane announced Way's favorite stipulation: this is now a two out of three falls match, and. It was just a little thing, but he starts complaining about his back to Kevin Owens, and the crowd just starts chanting asshole at Shane, and as we come back, Shane blasts Gable from behind, rams him into the desk, or sorry, that's when they went to commercial, after he attacked Gable. We come back, Shane is in control, and then Gable gets a crucifix, and man, was it a struggle for him to get this crucifix on Shane. He's not the most limber of guys, and... Owens gets down on his knees and counts the slowest cover. So he's doing the whole heel ref shtick so that he can avoid getting fined. And, man, I just thought this 
Kill, we're coming one. Killed Owens. I thought this was like just whatever momentum this guy had over the summer. Like we talked about a few weeks ago where he had to like cower to Shane because of the fine. And then this where, man, you just took he, all the air out of this guy. Out. Yeah. And they had done such a good job of getting where that guy was going into SummerSlam. He has completely been deflated. Completely, like, I, 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 and I know, like, I think... He was the, the stooge in this match. He was the stooge. Oh, yeah. And I think, I know that the idea is that, oh, he, he cares so much about his family's future that he's, you know, and this $100 fine that he's willing to, you know, um, uh, screw Chad Gable. Um, but I just, I feel like $100,000 isn't really enough for, for like, your one of your, you know, at one time, I would say top baby faces on SmackDown to completely sell out. Um I mean, I think at least like, you know, putting the risk of like firing or like I don't know, a uh, personal injury to a family member. I can understand that, but just dangling a $100,000 fine it just it makes Kevin Owens look really weak in character. So, for the rest of this match, it's Owens fast counting for Shane and Gable would kick out and then slow counting when Gable would hit his spots, including a top rope moonsault that Shane eventually kicked out of. Shane lifted Gable onto his shoulders into a spinning neck breaker. Again, a fast count that Gable kicks out of. Shane gets the chair and Owens tells him to stop. And Shane thinks it's all a plan from Owens. So he hands the chair. So Owens turns his back and Shane goes for a low kick but gets caught. And Gable applies the ankle lock. And he does the full-on uh, like heel hook version that Kurt would always do. And Shane is forced to tap. And therefore, Owens can only ring the bell. And Chad Gable wins. Uh, for Chad Gable, I thought this was great. But really, this presentation came at very much at the expense of Kevin Owens. But um, I, I thought for their roles, I, th- I thought Shane played this great with Gable. Uh, yeah, I, you know, Gable got actually two legit wins over Shane McMahon, who at, up until this point has been like, I would say, still pretty well protected with his special Dude, Chad Gable got what Roman Reigns didn't over Shane McMahon. Nor the Miz, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's too bad the the broadcast did couldn't focus more on Gable after this win uh, because they they didn't have much TV time left and they had to do the the, the McMahon Owens angle. Um, but again, I, I thought they tur- took a negative and really turned it into a positive here with uh, the Elias injury curveball. That part turned out well, and then. They announced that the King of the Ring finals are not going to be on Sunday. They're going to be Monday on Raw in Knoxville, Tennessee, between Chad Gable and Baron Corbin. Okay. And then the the final thing was Shane attacking Kevin Owens, stomping him down, and telling Kevin Owens he's fired. Yeah, I kept waiting for, like, the end of the segment to see, like, how Owens might have redeemed himself. But it never came. Like, in fact, the guy got fired. And by the end, when he got fired... I mean, I kind of found myself saying, "Good, you deserve it." I mean, look at look at what you did. Um, so, Owens kind of just comes out of this looking a little like a jerk and also somebody who got manipulated yet again. But you know, it's I'm just sure not a, a baby face. People get behind the one that gets outsmarted, that doesn't stand up when they're being bullied, and yeah, I I, I just thought it was really. Yeah, poorly done with with, with Kevin Owens, who y- you legitimately had something in uh, a month ago. And I think that that's just completely an afterthought now. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they're setting up... I would hope that they're setting up some type of comeback for Owens. You know, maybe coming out completely unhinged and, and not giving a shit at all. Uh, maybe going on a rampage, but I, I'm not so sure. I can't even bank on that. All right, that was SmackDown. Um... I thought certainly the last half hour of the show was was the strong point to the show. Other than that, I, I thought this was a pretty eh, below average show. I thought Raw was significantly better this week uh, for a go home show. Yeah, it was. It uh, didn't do a whole lot for me um, with the the final angles. The wrestling I thought wasn't as uh, quite as strong on this show, um, but I really enjoyed. The uh, Kofi Kingston, Randy Orton thing. I liked uh, overall what they did with Chad, uh, Chad Cable, Chad Gable, and Shane McMahon. Um, and you know, even the Rowan Roman beatdown was pretty decent. So I I still give it like a mild thumbs up. All right, we go on over to the forum forum dot The forum gives this one a six point one three. The Raw comes out ahead. 
Paul writes, who went to the show live at the Garden, shared an elevator with Sarah Schreiber. So that was cool. Ali defeated Murphy with a 450 in a dark match. They shook hands afterwards. Murphy received a good pop. Kofi and Orton was good. Bailey Moon had no heat. Shane killed the crowd initially. He drew This Is Boring chance, which may have been during the break. Kind of a pedestrian show. However, The Fiend defeated the B team in a dark match after 205 Live. Raw was better. Austin had a purpose. Taker didn't. If they said it was a sellout on TV, they lied. Still love coming to MSG. They, I don't believe they ever tried to call this one a sellout tonight. I don't think so either. No. Uh, we got a Jay from Colorado who wants to make this short and sweet. As a kid growing up in the <laughs> 80s who glued himself to the TV every Thursday night to watch Family Ties, I just marked the fuck out for Alex Keaton. <laughs> He's a big star on Tuesday night. <laughs> Matt in the 604. Does Kevin Owens firing last longer than when he quit last year? For John... Donald Cerrone was on our local morning radio show to promote his fight on Saturday and said he wants to fight on the end of the year card at 170. Do you think that's viable for him? Yes. Uh, Cerrone is, it's weird. Like he always had the rep that this is a guy who would just immediately come back and want to get as many fights in as possible. And then he, over the last year had started to say that, you know, I, I'm not giving myself the best opportunities by just quickly turning around. And now he's right back to that kind of mindset that, I mean, from September to December, it's not crazy, especially if he's not coming back at lightweight, which is a significant cut for Cerrone to get down to. But I could I, I could see that being possible. Their last pay-per-view is December 14th. So he would have three months to turn around. So I, I don't rule it out completely. Um, but that is a tough turnaround. We got a Chris Thunder from Down Under who's it, who says, After seeing this past month of King of the Ring, I think we can all put the rest of the notion of the main roster ever doing a tournament like the G1. Honestly, a three-way semifinal. Why couldn't Ricochet or Joe lose if neither advance next week? Elias beating Owens and Ali only to be replaced by McMahon. And finally, Jobber Chad Gable returning for main event to run the table on SmackDown. Maybe Corbin will win on Raw now. It's not a pay-per-view match anymore. Does the winner revive a championship, receive a championship match at least? They haven't said the winner gets anything other than a crown. Yeah, nothing. Uh, Brandon from Oshawa. What the hell are they doing with Kevin Owens? I get that he's a family guy. They've hit on that since his NXT days. But why does that mean he has to look so weak? Why does he need to beg not to be fined or act like a wimp after Shane changes the stipulations in the main event? I guess they I guess they think people will feel sorry for him and get behind him more. But I really don't think so. People want someone that kicks ass and defies authority. See? Stone cold. Not someone who whines and complains and acts like a total wimp. Joey from Queens. I was at the show live and good God was I disappointed. While the show leading up to the main event was fair enough, that main event made me want to pull my hair out. Maybe I get we're it. the only ones who got into this main event. I get it. They wanted to stack the odds against Cable and give that sweet underdog pop to send the crowd home happy. But do they want Owens to be the next Stone Cold or not? Because if that's how they think Stone Cold would rough a match with Vince in it, then I have a bridge to sell them. I truly hope this was not their plan all along to make Owens look like the biggest geek this side of the East River. And this has to be hot shotted because of the Elias injury. Because if it was, then we're in for some spicy booking come the move to Fox. I mean, to me, the Elias injury is immaterial of how you could have handled Kevin Owens in this match. Like, there was a role to play in this match where you build up to one big spot where Owens is conflicted and ultimately he helps Gable win. And it it gets the big pop where you don't know if he's going to side with Shane, but ultimately he doesn't because that's what the audience wants to believe Kevin Owens would do in this situation. He's telling this guy, fuck you. No one's going to manipulate me. But instead, they did the opposite. Next up here. Hey, guys, I'm on my way back from the show, and I enjoyed it. Maybe because I was only there for about two hours, but I'm happy with what I saw. I felt uh, It felt like a house show to me. The crowd loved Chad Gable, and nobody knows what's going on with Kevin Owens. The Undertaker segment was fun, but poor Sami Zayn. Unfortunately, I couldn't stay, stay for the dark match main event, which was the B-team versus The Fiend. Have either of you watched the uh, Game Changer Black Label Pro show from All Out Weekend? Definitely recommend the DLC match and the six-man tag. Both were absolutely wild. Good night. I have not seen this show. No. That was a very busy weekend, and I was not piling on more wrestling than the three shows I watched that day. Was this the, the show where the guy almost bled to death? This was where G-Raver had that awful spot with the light tubes and sliced up his arm. Yeah. That was the only thing I saw from him. I have not seen the show. All right. Is that it? <laughs> 
That's it. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your feedback tonight. As we mentioned, Way and I are back Wednesday night with the double shot. If you're a cafe member, then you can tune in for that. But before we get out of here, we've got a prize to give away. Oh, man, I completely forgot. Um, right at the buzzer. Yeah. So if you've stayed till the end, you may find out. if you, You're all winners, but some of you will be a larger winner than everybody else. You know what, so Way, John? Uh, what was your favorite feedback uh, of, of the show today? Is that how we're going to pick? For this one, sure. Okay. Uh, you know what? Let's, uh, I'm going to, I'm always partial to the live reports. Mm -hmm. So I am going to go with, let's see. We had a, we had a few here who went to the show. I am going to go, you know what? Let's give it to Joey from Queens. That's who I was thinking too. So congratulations, Joey from Queens. You win a t-shirt. Wow. Congratulations, Joey. You never know what you're going to get if you send in a live report. All right. Uh, That will really wrap up the show. So thank you to all of you for tuning in tonight. Uh, We'll be back Wednesday night, chatting glow. Who knows what else? And then the cafe hangout on Thursday. So uh, with all that said, goodbye.